Well, welcome back, gang. We are hoping you had a good experience in your first small group session as uh, you got together and began to look at the text together and think about that together. So um, as we get into this session, let me just say a word of prayer again as we uh, come to learn some principles of expository preaching and, and looking at the text and the importance of the Bible. So let's, uh, let's come before the Lord and ask for his wisdom and guidance. Gracious God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you did not leave us in the dark, but you gave us your word. You sent us your spirit. And your word and your spirit work together in the lives of your people for transformation. And so, Lord, would you now teach us how to uh, understand your word, how to read your word, how to um, comprehend what your word means to us. And Lord, may we lay our opinions at the foot of your throne. May you determine how we uh, not only read the Bible, but how we understand it and how we share it with the world around us. Uh, thank you for our time together. May you open our minds uh, to your truth and your guidance, and uh, may you be glorified in all we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second lecture is uh, entitled The Big Picture, where we, of course, are looking at the topic of the Bible, the scriptures. And uh, before we get to that topic, I just want us to review what we saw in the first lecture and what we uh, heard what we worked on a little bit in the small group, and that basically is uh, understanding that expository preaching is hearing and applying the message of a particular text in the context of the book that we're working with in the larger context of the whole story of the scriptures. And uh, again, uh, the, the whole story of the scriptures, what is the whole story of the scriptures, uh, I, I, su I suggested that the whole story of the scriptures was the, that the story of God calling and redeeming a people for himself, his people, through Jesus Christ. Uh, Brother John, um, after uh, that lecture, he and I were talking on the side, and he said, yeah, but what about the, uh, the, the idea of the creation, fall, redemption, consummation? I said, that's a fantastic way to think about it. I'm not saying that my one sentence theme of the whole Bible is the only way to think about it. I'm suggesting that's my way to think about it. And, uh, it, and I think the, 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 that message, which has been used uh, for a long time, in, in, uh, in the, especially in the Reformed understanding of the tradition of the scriptures of creation, fall, redemption, or creation, fall, redemption, consummation, I think that's a beautiful way to think about it. And if you can explain what the Bible is in less than a minute using creation, fall, redemption, consummation, I say go for it. Absolutely. Uh, there's more than uh, one way to skin a cat. That's one uh, idiom that we use in, in English in America. I'm not sure it's a very uh, edifying idiom for cats, but uh, there's more than one way to do almost every task. So um, as you think about it, uh, you need, to, you need to find a description of what the Bible is that works for you that is obviously accurate with the message of the Bible. Uh, it reminds me of a story of uh, a, a fellow who said to D.L. Moody a hundred years ago, the famous preacher D.L. Moody in, in Chicago, Illinois, said, uh, Reverend Moody, I don't like the way you do evangelism. And Moody uh, said to him, um, well, what, what style or method of evangelism do you use? And the fellow said, well, I don't really have a style or a method for evangelism. And Moody said, well, I like my method better than yours. <laughs> so uh, if, you don't like, if you don't like my one sentence theme of what the Bible is, that's great. Create your own. Uh, do it the way you want, but make sure that it's consistent with the message of the scriptures, the creation, fall, redemption, consummation, the work of uh, Jesus Christ doing the work of redemption and salvation in the people of God. So, expository preaching is that message of a particular text in the context of the book, in the context of the whole story of the scriptures. And we saw that expository preaching involves listening to the theme of a book. So we need to read the whole book. 
we can't just jump into a text and pick out the first uh, paragraph or the first pericope or the first few verses or the first verse. We need to listen. What is the whole book about? Listen to the message of the text. Uh, and, and I think it's healthy to uh, read the text in different versions. You could uh, read it in your favorite version, the re- version you're going to preach from. Perhaps uh, if you have the ability to do work in the original languages, uh, Greek or Hebrew, you could uh, read it in those uh, languages. Uh, or perhaps uh, you have your own vernacular language, but you can read the English text also. Uh, you, not only do you read, but I actually like to go online, go to BibleGateway.com, and I listen to the text being read. And of, for, of course, historically, uh, especially the letters of the church, very likely this is how they would have been experienced first and foremost by the, the broader group of the churches. Paul would write a letter to a church, uh, would send it off with a courier who would arrive to give that letter to the elders. They would gather on on the day of uh, the Lord's Day, and they would read that letter publicly, and so the people would hear the the scripture being read to them. They would hear the letter from Paul, or the letter from Peter, or the letter from John, or this letter to the Hebrews uh, being read in a public setting. So I listen to the text. I want to listen uh, to a whole chapter. I want to listen to a whole section of the book so that I'm listening for the message of the text. And expository uh, preaching involves listening to the message, of course, of the Bible, which we've already said. So let's ask this question as we get into the big picture conversation. What is the Bible? Now, the word Bible is, uh, we get that word Bible from the Greek word biblios, which simply means book. So when we say, I believe in the Bible, we just are technically, literally saying, I believe in the book. And, of course, in Greece, uh, a biblios wasn't necessarily sacred. There was about millions of books. There were lots of different books, a gathering of information. Libraries were filled with biblios. So the word Bible just simply means book. But for us, for those who believe that the word of God is the inspired and authoritative uh, revelation of God, for those who believe that the Bible is our only rule for life and faith, we believe the Bible is something unique. But the question is, do we read the Bible as a theological textbook? Is it like a systematic theology? Is it like a reference book? Do we say, this is a reference book for my questions and my problems that I face in my church or my family or my culture? What does the church say about human sexuality? What does the church say about marriage? What does the the Bible say about politics? What does the Bible say about the sin, uh, this particular sin or that particular sin? Is it just a reference book where we can go and look up and see what the Bible says about these different topics? Perhaps uh, some would say, I read the Bible for wisdom or I read it for inspiration. Uh, I feel lonely, I feel scared, so I open the Bible and I read a psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, that's inspirational, that's comforting. But do we only use the Bible for this purpose? Do we take it out uh, in times of sorrow? Well, I certainly do that, but if that's the only reason I do it, if it sits on the shelf until I feel lonely and depressed and then I retrieve the Bible to make me feel better, that's not very a uh, faithful way to treat the scriptures. Some would say, I use the Bible for wisdom. How do, I de- how do I think about money? How do I think about work? How do I think about family? How do I think, how do I train my children to obey my parents? The wisdom literature. And so we, we go to the Bible to to glean wisdom for our relationships in the Song of Solomon. We, we go to the Bible in the book of Proverbs for how to raise our sons and our daughters so that they listen to the wisdom of their parents. Well, these are right and good, but if that's all the Bible is, then that's a distortion of what the Bible is. Or do we read the Bible as a proof text for our favorite beliefs? 
I, I, I feel strongly about predestination, or I'm against predestination, or I'm, I'm for the speaking in tongues, or I'm against speaking in tongues, and I'm for uh, water baptism by immersion only, or I'm for a covenant baptism and the sprinkling of, uh, of children. And so I use the Bible as a proof text for my theological, particular theological belief. Is that what the Bible is for? Well, I would say that we all are guilty of using the Bible as a theological textbook and as a reference book and as a book of wisdom and inspiration and comfort. We're all guilty of using the Bible for proof texting our favorite doctrines and beliefs. But if that's primarily what the scripture is, I would say we even abuse the scriptures. And we as preachers, when we preach, this is, this is not how we should approach the Bible. The Bible is not primarily a textbook, a reference book, a comfort book, or a proof text for our favorite belief. So the Bible, what do we have when we find this book? Do we have one book? Indeed we do. The Bible is one book that is unified in its message and its purpose. That's why I can put it into one sentence. The, the Bible is the story of God calling and redeeming a people for himself through Jesus Christ. I can say that's true from Genesis to Revelation because it's one book with one message and one purpose. There are many themes and we can trace from Genesis to Revelation, but they all play into that one message. One book. Or is it 66 books? Well, of course it is 66 books. There's 66 individual books that were written by many different people in many different places and in many different times. <coughs> it's been pointed out that there are the Bible has not only 66 different books, but there were over 40 different authors of those 66 different books. Now you take the other sacred books of other world religions, take for example the Quran in Islam, or you take uh, the Book of Mormon in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and in both cases, the Book of Mormon and the Quran, these books were translated from, uh, it received a, a, a so they would suggest, from God to Muhammad, or from God to Joseph Smith, one man and one man only received the message from God which he wrote down. The Quran was written not in story form, but it's written in verses. There is no context, there is no historical context, there is no literary context. It's just one verse after another, coming through Muhammad. But the Bible has got 40 different authors writing 66 different books. Well, can one man manipulate a text? Can one man make the text say what that man wants to say? Yes, of course. One man, whether it's Joseph or Muhammad or some other uh, sacred writer, can manipulate a text and create it by his own humanistic purposes to say what he wants it to say. But the reality is, uh, in 66 different books written over 1,200 years by 40 different authors in multiple different countries in uh, four major languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Ugaritic, these people didn't know each other. They lived in Egypt, and they lived in Persia, and they lived in Palestine, and they lived in Rome, and they lived in Turkey. They lived in different centuries, separated by time and space. There is no way that 40 people who wrote the Bible came together to manipulate and to conspire to come up with the message of the Bible. It was orchestrated by the inspiration and the authority of the Holy Spirit of God, moving men to write in the way he moved them to write. Each book then contains a particular message, and it's written in a to a particular people in a particular place. 
And so if you're reading a message that was written to the, uh, the Ephesians or the Philippians or, or the Thessalonians, you need to understand what, who those people were and what their issues and their particular problems were. And so all of these different books written for these different purposes, this poetry, this, this wisdom literature, these prophetic books of the Old Testament, these historical narratives, this law that is laid down, these gospel messages, this apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature of Daniel or Ezekiel or Revelation, each one of these books has its message. But that message plays into the overall picture. A great example of that is this picture of a, a, a mosaic, a photo mosaic. I don't know if you're familiar with the idea of a photo mosaic. Here's a picture on the screen on the, on the PowerPoint that you can see. There is an overall picture of the cityscape. It's got the skyscrapers. And you can see the windows and the lights that are on and the, and the, and the trees out front and, and, and the people on the sidewalk. And yet if you zoom in on a very small picture, a, a portion of that overall picture, you'll see that each area is created by many separate pictures coming together to give the overall picture. Uh, not long ago I was uh, traveling and teaching in Romania and following my teaching time uh, for item in Romania, I flew to Greece and I visited some of the biblical sites in Greece, uh, Athens and Corinth and uh, Thessaloniki. And then uh, we, uh, my, uh, my teaching partner and I uh, went to uh, uh, Metaora, which is the mountainous region of central Greece. And in uh, the 7th or 8th century, when the Ottoman Turks took over the Mediterranean world, the Orthodox uh, monasteries on Crete needed to flee the Ottoman Turks. And so uh, they fled to central Greece, where these mountainous spires, these look like chimneys, these, these, these columns of rock, and they would climb up on top of these columns of rock and they would build a monastery there. Just an amazing, amazing place. If you have never had an opportunity to visit there, you should go and find them. Metaora, Greece. Find it online and look at the photos. It's amazing. Well, in these monasteries, you see a lot of mosaics. And you see these beautiful uh, mosaics of Jesus or the crucifixion or some other biblical story. But of course, each one of those mosaics has got a big picture. But in that picture is made up of hundreds of little pieces of pottery or, 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 or some other colored stone that they've put together to make the mosaic. Well, of course, this is a picture of what the Bible is. There's one overall picture of the Bible but it's made up of all these different themes and all these different stories. Each book has its own story. And so preaching the message of the scripture, we need to understand that in expository preaching, the preacher has the task of pointing the church both to the whole message of the Bible, the big mosaic message of the Bible, which is God's work of salvation in Jesus Christ. And then the preacher needs to narrow the focus down to the particular theme of each individual book and then each individual text. So how do we find the theme of a book? You see there on the PowerPoint this picture of uh, musical notes and one thing that Americans and American culture has been uh, wrapped up in and unfortunately in too many ways we've exported our sin to the rest of the world. One of the ways that we export uh, the distortions of our culture is through movies. And so you uh, likely have seen an American movie uh, once or twice or many, many times perhaps. Uh, some of you may think that's a bad thing. Others may like them. I'm not here to pass judgment. Sometimes I like them. Sometimes I hate them. The point is this. Often, uh, one of the techniques that Hollywood uses to keep us entertained is to build this thematic line, this melodic line, through a movie. And so you take a movie, uh, perhaps like uh, an adventure, like the, uh, like the Marvel comic adventure movies, or Batman, or Star Wars, and they have a theme song. They have a score of music 
that every time you hear uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark 35 years ago had a, had a particular musical score that every time you heard that theme, you knew that the hero was about to arrive. You knew that the, the person was going to show up and save the, uh, solve the problem in, in, in whatever in the story. And, of course, the scripture has the same melodic, uh, similarly has a, a melodic line that goes throughout the scriptures. And when we hear these themes, we can know that God, the hero of the Bible, is about to show up and save his people again. And so each book of the Bible has a theme to it. The theme is the message of that particular book. What's the big idea? What's God doing in this book? The theme addresses the problem in the historical setting in that place. And so remember, the theme of a book is the message that God addressed to a particular audience then and there, in that day, in that time, back then and there, addressing a specific need or needs in a time, in a specific time, in a specific context. So how do we identify the theme of a book? Well, there's a number of ways that we do that, and, and, and Brother John's going to share some of those more specifically and down, get down into the nitty-gritty of that and really see the details of that, but I'll just list a few here now. When we are trying to identify the theme of a book, we should look for the idea of repeated words, repeated ideas, or repeated themes or, or phrases. Uh, we see that uh, there is sometimes a purpose statement. Sometimes the author comes right out and tells you why he's writing. The Gospel of John, for example, in chapter 20, following the resurrection account of Jesus. John says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John tells us what his purpose is. That's the theme. The theme of the book of John is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not always that clear, however. Sometimes you have to look at the structure of the book. Sometimes it's the poetry. Sometimes the narrative, the story, the flow, the, 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 the tension and the climax of the, of the story reveals the, the theme of the book. How does God show up and become the hero of that story? So we do to, to discover that, we read the, 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 we read the book from the beginning to the end. We need to read the whole thing. We don't just jump in and begin preaching Hebrews. We need to read the whole book. And then we identify the problem or the occasion of the book. Why, uh, the, why was this letter written? Why was Hebrews written? Uh, we'll see throughout this, uh, the work that you do in the small text and the sample sermons that Hebrews was written because these folks, these Jewish Christians, were being tempted to give up on Jesus. After all, they've been following Jesus and, and life isn't easy for them. They're uh, oppressed, they're rejected, their families have turned their back on them, they've been kicked out of the synagogue. We don't know all the situations, but they have been invited to be, give up on faith in Jesus and and just simply return to old-fashioned Judaism. That's the problem in the occasion of the book. And we'll see that throughout. And then there's, of course, a historical context. Uh, and we'll have uh, Brother John talk more about that in a little bit. So these are the ways that we begin to look for and identify a theme of the book and uh, we're going to now uh, send you back into a small group session and begin to work and practice, uh, do a little more, dig a little deeper, uh, get, dig down a little deeper and find out. Make sure you work together, share your answers, you're working, uh, uh, collaborating together. It's all right to cheat this time. You can look on your neighbor's paper. This isn't a test. The test comes when we stand in the pulpit and deliver the word of God for the glory of God alone. Amen. Thanks. Have fun in small group. We'll see you back here in a little bit.